Good morning, everybody. On a good geben shtir, aksiv of achsim atayv, roshan atayv, amsuke to all of you and your families, your mushpayim, your students, your pupils, your disciples, your children, the children under your care. In addition, of course, to your own uh, loved ones, they tell an anecdote about a rabbi who would always give sermons about the need to be sensitive, empathetic, loving towards children. One day, they were paving his driveway. And you know when children see fresh pavement, you remember when you were children? They like to leave a mark in this world. They like to leave their imprint on God's planet. They right away started to dance hakafas on his new pavement, tattooing, engraving various messages, names, slogans, ideas. And the rabbi saw this. He comes out to the porch and he begins hollering the top of his lungs. You're a bunch of spoiled, rotty, horrible kids. You're the worst of the worst chastising them, giving them very, very intense musa, screaming. His wife hears her husband screaming, so she comes out and she sees what's going on. He's screaming at a bunch of terrified kids, and she looks at him and she says, I don't understand you. Every Shabbos, you speak so eloquently about the art of discipline, the art of education, how to affect children in a positive and nurturing and powerful way. What are you screaming at them and hollering at them? And he says, listen, I love children in the abstract, not in the concrete. <laughs> Very often, theorists on education speak in the abstract. And in the abstract, everything is always perfect and beautiful. The challenge is always to address it in the concrete. It's just like in any other art of life. They say there was once a, uh, a big Rav who also considered himself a Makubal, who came to a particular community in New York, and a couple came to see him. Unfortunately, they were infertile. They couldn't have children. They asked him for a bracha, to daven for them. And he said, I'm going back to Eretz Yisrael. Give me your names, put it on a tzetela, a kvittel, and I'm going to go to the Kaisal Amaravi, and I'm going to put it in, and I'm going to daven for you there. They give him their names and their mother's names. Wonderful. He leaves. He comes back five years later to the same town. He's walking in the street, and he sees the lady who came to him five years ago. And he says, hi, how have you been? Have there been positive developments? She says, ah, hoidu la shem ki toiv ki chaz de baruch Hashem, our home is graced with 10 children. He looks at her. I've been there five years ago, 10 children, it's a little fast. I mean, I know there's a concept called Kvitzes Aderech, and Jewish mothers are superwomen. I mean, we all know that, especially on this side. But, uh, but I mean, it's a little fast. So she says, listen, we didn't waste any time. The first year I had triplets, Baruch Hashem. The next year I had twins. Then we decided we need a little break. So we took a little break, and then again, we had twins, we had triplets. Thank God we have a minion of children in our home. And the rabbi starts celebrating. That's the best news, it's awesome, unbelievable. Where's your husband? I want to give him a big hug, give him a mazel tov. She says, my husband is out of town. Where is he? He went to Eretz Yisrael. What's that person? Business, relative stuff. He went to Yerushalayim. Why? He went to the Kaisal. Why? He's looking for the note. He wants to take it out. <laughs> he wants to take out the note. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> you know that children, I don't have to explain this to this crowd, are the greatest blessing in the world. There's no blessing like the blessing of children. <laughs> but they also come with a set of challenges. Somehow, everything in this world comes with a manual. You buy a stupid telephone, and you have a manual of 400 pages. You buy a vacuum cleaner, it comes with a manual. You get a car, for sure, it comes with a manual. You get a tablecloth or a little watch, it comes with a manual, at least 40 pages with instructions. 
Somehow the most important thing in the world, imagine if every child that was born came with an operator's manual. Your boy Nishlelem would say, okay, this is what this girl needs, this is what this boy needs, this you stay away from, this will not work on this child. If I guess it worked on your old one, it's not going to... Somehow we got to figure it out by trial and error. Good luck. But there's no manual. But it's not, it's not the greatest blessing. And as every great blessing, it comes also with a profound challenge and sometimes profound headaches and migraines. Zayid, he needed a home. So he saw on 13th Avenue, somebody uh, was renting out the, uh, the <coughs> excuse me, the top floor of the home. So he comes, he says, I want to lease it for two years. Man says there's a condition. Condition is, Khtafa Meshpocha on kinder. Family without children. If you could just put your cell phones on vibrate, I'm ADD, so I get mixed up. If you could just put your cell phones on vibrate, I would appreciate it. And also when you do therapy on kids, put your phones on vibrate. So person says, Vosepis. He says, listen. I'm an older man, my wife is an older lady, we go to sleep 8.30. We can't deal with Brooklyn Jewish children. For Tanzen of the Kep, a Ganzenach, they dance on your heads all night. We want quiet. You want to move upstairs, Gesundheit, hate about a couple on Kinder. He says, good, that fits the bill. They sign a contract, everybody is happy. First night, the couple goes to sleep, 8.30. They're looking forward. Bikish, Yaakov, Leisha, Bashalva, Kofa, Tzalov. Suddenly they hear Metanus, Mishpring, not 10 minutes, 4 hours. Finally, 12.30 a.m., the couple can't fall asleep. The man runs upstairs and he sees 14 children. Of course, under the age of 14, Cain Yerbu. Metans, they're moving the furniture, they're hollering, they're jumping, and they're just beginning the night. The landlord looks at the tenant and he says, Lomari Misoni, why'd you lie to me? Why'd you deceive to me? He says, I didn't lie to you. He said, We made up a mishpacha on kinder. He says, Das a kinder? Das a chayas. <laughs> and our children, these are animals. Some of us grew up in certain schools with certain classes where we were commonly identified by those titles. I once had a teacher who did not get a PhD in pedagogy, let's put it that way, who once told us, he says, I'm much greater than the Maharal of Prague. Maharal had one goylam, I have 19 goylams. And he said, the Maharal's goylam couldn't speak. My goylams know how to speak. And this is where I have my self-confidence from. <laughs> this is what boosted my ego and made me feel as a valuable set of citizen and a special person. But this was very, very common language. Bahamas, Chayas, Shkotzim, Mishugoyim, crazy kids, sick kids. It took a couple of decades and a lot of pain and a lot of trauma, and a lot of hurt, for people to start discovering that somehow this is not essential to Judaism. <laughs> somehow Judaism doesn't believe in negativity, and only in negativity, in traumatizing and scaring the living daylights, and in denigrating people, in denigrating the most cherished members of society, the future of God's world, as the Gemara says in Shabbos, Al Tigui be Meshichoi, Elu Tinoikes shall be Rabban. Meshichoi, my little Mashiachs, my little anointed ones. And I once was talking to educators and I said, What's the meaning of Meshichoi? When you were a children, every child, when they grow up, they have a little dream of making a big difference in the world. You're small, you fantasize, the sky is the limit. 
Every Jewish child has a dream of either being Mashiach or bringing Mashiach or doing something equivalent. But usually when we grow up, we become a little jaded. We become a little cynical. Never ever kill the little Mashiach in you. Never kill the child in you. Always remain, hold on to that innocence, to that optimism, to that confidence that you could change the world. Don't stifle, don't eradicate, don't obliterate that spark of life, that spark of joy, of optimism within yourself. And when you can cherish the child within yourself, you can cherish uniquely the child that you're dealing with. A few days will be Rosh Hashanah, an interesting thing. Rosh Hashanah celebrates the anniversary of creation, the world, everything. Hayoyim haras oilam. Today is the birthday of the world. Zeh hayoyim tchilas ma'asecha, we say in Musaf, from the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah of Zion. Zeh hayoyim tchilas ma'asecha, as he currently am Rishon. Iran says the world was created a few days earlier, but Adam and Chava were created, and they're the crown jewel of creation, the human being, Yitzurei Kap of Shalakadosh Baruch. You open up the Kriya Satayr of Rosh Hashanah, what would, if you had to institute what we should read on Rosh Hashanah, what would you institute? What's Pasach? Pesach, you read the story of Pesach, yeah? Chanukah, you read about Chanukah Samishkin. Purim, you read about Amalek. Tisha B'Av, you read about Galos. Shvua Sukkis, you read about the Parshish of Yom Tif. Yom Kippur, you read the parsha of Yom Kippur, Achir Emois. What should you read, Rosh Hashanah? The parsha is voracious. Vayivre elikim esadam b'tzalmoi, vayichil ha-shamayim v'arz v'chal tzvam, vayipach b'ap of nishmas chayim, he created Adam, he created Chavim. This is what you're celebrating. Hayoi mara asoylam, the creation of the world. There's no zeicher of it to kriyas ha-toyda. Not a p'sah ha-yisof, and there's tepes ha-mafte. What do you read on Rosh Hashanah both days? about children. And both Haftarists, all about children. The first day of Kriya Satayra, you learn about Sarah's yearning to have a child, about Hagar having a child, about the fate of Yishmael, the fate of Yitzchak. The second day you learn about Avram and Yitzchak, Vayel, Chushleim, Yachdov. The Haftarist of the first day is Hannah yearning for a child, Shmuel. The Haftarist of the second day Zacharti lo chesed no raich, avas kluloi saich, habein yakerli, Ephraim im yele cha shuim, kimide zochri boy, homu mei loi, rachem arachemen, alkein homu mei loi, rachem arachemen unum hashem. How do you explain this? The answer is because with this kriya satayra de chazal, all the way back from the earlier generations, we're demonstrating that from the Jewish perspective, how do you celebrate the world? How do you celebrate humanity? How do you celebrate civilization? Only one way. By focusing on the children. On the child. Or as the Ponovich once said, children without parents are orphans. But parents who don't know how to raise their children, he said, orphaned children are children without parents. An orphan generation is a generation of parents or educators who don't know how to reach their children. So Rosh Hashanah, when we celebrate the entire planet and the entire universe and the entire cosmos and Adam and Chava, how does it happen? By tuning in to the story of a few mothers yearning to be able to have a child, to raise a child, to be there for a child. By focusing on Hashem listening to the koil hanar ba'asher husham, the voice of the child thirsty for nourishment and for nurture. And Avram and Yitzchak walking together a hundred years apart, but vayel chushneim yachdov, it says twice. They walk, both of them walk together. Yachdov, intimacy, unison, Closeness, connection. The Gemara says 
What are the obligations of a father? What are the obligations of a father? See, the father has a few obligations. To make sure he has a bris. If he's a koyen, I'm sorry, if he's a pchor, a firstborn, he has to liberate him from the koyen. There's something else. Lalam de Torah. To teach him Torah. There's another obligation. Not so popular today. Lalam de Yumnus. Got to teach him a job. You have to teach him to have a trait. Another one. Lisoyisha. You had to help him find a spouse. Viyesh Oimrim. Afla Shutai Bamayim. You have to teach him how to swim. Teach him how to swim. From everything in the world, you've got to teach him how to swim. Mm. And the Gemara brings, call me Shaina Malamde Umnus, Malamde Listus. If you don't teach him a job, you don't teach him how to hold a job, you're teaching him to become a thief. What are these examples, my friends? I see these not only as the specific description the Gemara says but also as symbolic of the role of educators, fathers and mothers, teachers, and in our case, celebrated and wonderful therapists. The first thing the parent, the educator gives the child is a bris. A bris is identity. Who are you? A bris is the covenant of every Jewish boy, and as the Gemara says, Isha, Command the Mehiladam. It's not like a woman is not in the covenant. She's just naturally part of the covenant. She doesn't have to go through Abris physically, as the Gemara says in Avoy Dezara. But the first thing is identity. Who are you? The Bris represents you're part of a family, you're part of a covenant, you're part of a people, you're part of a nation. Identity, to know who you are. Or as the Kotzke Rebbe once said, you got it? Okay, I'll translate. Your father didn't teach you Yiddish? He taught you how to swim? He told you to get a job, I see. Wow, that already makes you unique. You should call him and say thank you. <laughs> the Kotzke Rebbe said like this, if I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I, then I am I, and then I am not I and you are not you, but if I am I because I am I and you are you because you are you, then I am I and you are you. And now we can begin to schmooze. Identity. All people are born originals, yet many of us die as copies. The bris represents who you are, where you come from. The father is also obligated to redeem the child. What does this mean? To teach a child that you're never stuck. You're never a victim. You may have challenges. You may have a disability. Some things may be harder for you. But your life is not a life of victimhood. Your life has infinite potential and dignity if you could fulfill the mission for which you were created. That's the second obligation of a father and a parent and an educator and a therapist. The third one is Talmud Torah. Values. What is right? What is wrong? Teach the child, the boy or the girl, morals, values. The next is help him or her find a spouse, which of course means marriage, but it also means help the person show them how they could become a contributing member of society. Of course, there's no way and position where you are challenged to be a giver, as in the case of marriage. And finally, he says, you've got to teach the child how to swim. And as Fasema says, what that means is, symbolically is, 
This world is a tsunami. It's very easy to drown. To be able to give a child the confidence that you could swim, you could navigate the waves, you can keep your head above water, not because there's no water, and not because there are no heavy waves, and not because there are no heavy tsunamis, but because you have the power, you have the resources to be able to swim. And in many ways, that is probably one of the great descriptions of your role and your job every single day. When you meet those children, those precious children, under your care, identity, you're not stuck. Your life has purpose and there are values. You could become a giver, not only a taker. And all the waves in the world, all the tsunamis in the world can't drown you because you have the power to overcome them. I want to share with you a story. When I heard the story as a yeshiva bacher, it made a very deep, deep, deep impact on me. A classmate of mine, a yeshiva, was having a birthday. He made a little birthday party. He brought a relative of his to speak. And the relative shared a story. He once visited a yeshiva. A yeshiva in Brooklyn. It was a very competitive yeshiva. High-level, competitive yeshiva. And uh, there was a boy who came over to speak to him. And the boy told him he has a struggle. His IQ is low. It's hard for him to get things. He sits in yeshiva. And there's a challenge. He has a chavrusa. Chavrusa finishes in an hour what takes him a week. A page of Gemara. An Amit or a Blad Gemar, Chavrusa does it in an hour, it takes him a week, and even then, he has to review it and review it a hundred times, and he knows it, and could still review it many times, and he feels frustrated. And he went to one of the people in the yeshiva, one of the staff members, and he said, it's not fair. I want to be a gadol. I want to be a great person, I want to be a shalom, I want to be a perfect, I want to be gadol, and I'll never be, because I'll never be matzliach in learning. So this staff member tells him, listen, every gadol needs talmidim. <laughs> G'doylem need k'tanim. You can't have g'doylem if there's no k'tanim. You can't have big people, no small people. He needs students. You'll be one of the students. So it's not fair. It's not fair. So he goes to another staff member. Another staff member, Chagreser Chachem, says, g'doylem need money. <laughs> Somebody got to support them. You'll go, you'll make money. You'll support him. He says, Lamani go. I want to be the Godel. I don't want to be the support. I don't want to be the Nachschlep. I want to be the Godel. He went to a third guy in the yeshiva, Mashgiach, and the guy says, it's probably a punishment for sins you did in a previous reincarnation. <laughs> you know, we Baruch Hashem live in a place where everybody knows why other people suffer. Gilgulim, Tzniyas, Internet, this, every, it's always the women, by the way. Always the women. Always the women. <laughs> Mazel, well, the women don't speak at Levias. Then it would be the men. Men get to speak. They blame the women. Anyway. So, uh, this Mashgiach tells him, probably in a previous Gilgal, you sinned. And this is the punishment, that you can't be a Godel. But the good news is, next time around, you'll be a Godel. So this boy tells this, he told him, says, this is a crazy place. You're made to feel like a loser. And they're told, listen, you got to have some losers in society because if not, there's no winners. <laughs> if everybody's a winner, then there's no winners, right? If everybody's rich, there's no rich. You got to have losers so some people could feel like winners. This is a beautiful religion, isn't it? Inspiring. He says, this is a corrupt, this is a corrupt idea. And if this is what God believes in, I have no connection to this. Smart kid. So this Yid, this Yid, he says, it's an interesting shayla you have. Takes you a week to learn an Ahmed Gemara. Your friends learn it in an hour or two hours. At least they think they do. They'll become the G'doylem. You feel like mamish inadequate. And you feel like you don't belong. You want to be a G'dol. So he suggested to him that he should share his dilemmas with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He was a literary shabacher, but he thought it's good, an objective voice, not from your circles. So the boy wrote a whole letter to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, 
And he wrote the whole story. I want to be a gadol. I want to be a Muslim. I went to this one. He tells me that gadol needs students. This one says a gadol needs money. This one says it's for previous Gilgulim. I decided to quit yeshiva. I don't want this whole thing. Ainly chaylik. This is ridiculous. But somebody who seems intelligent suggested that I should ask you. So I'm asking you. So the Bible never wrote this bacher a whole length. So a whole beautiful, beautiful letter. I'm going to tell you one insight he wrote to this boy. Because I think it captures such a fundamental idea in hashkafa. When it comes to chinuch, especially when it comes to your work as therapists. And he wrote to this boy as follows. The Mishnah says in Kiddushin, I was created to serve Hashem. Every person was created to serve Hashem. The Gemara also says, Nothing is wasted. The Gemara also says, I ask of you what you could do. Every person, that means, was created to serve Hashem, but no two people were created alike. The Mishnah says in Sanhedrin, no two people are alike. You know, even if you have twins, they're not alike. That means Hashem doesn't want any two people to serve Him in the same way. If He would, He would have created them the same way. No two people are alike. It means every person has a different way in which He serves Hashem. It also means that Hashem gave you gave every person the exact amount of koiches, faculties, talents, and resources he or she needs to serve him in the way Hashem wants this child to serve him. He didn't give the person extra, because if he gave him extra, they're wasted. And he also didn't give the person anything less than exactly what they need to serve Hashem the way Hashem wants this person should serve him. Loi pachis v'loyos. If he gave you more, then there's no purpose to them and there's nothing levatala. If he gave you less, it's not fair. He said, even a human manufacturer, a human creator, imagine you make a stander, you build a stander, and the stander can't hold a book. You build a table, and it collapses. You build a chair, the first time you sit down on it, it collapses. You don't know what you're doing? You fill in a cavity, and it's not full. Even a human person who creates something, you create it in a way that it could fulfill its purpose. You say, Rebbeinu Shalom created a soul and it can't fulfill its purpose. Doesn't make sense. So you have exactly what you need to fulfill your shlichus, not more, not less. And every person is different. Therefore, every person has different qualities, different challenges, different blessings, different background, different journey, different life story, different mind, different psyche, different brain, different nisham. And here he comes to the last sentence, the punchline. He says, and when you use your koiches that Hashem gave you to serve Him the way He wants you to serve Him, ein lecha shalem, ve ein lecha gadol, l'may l'mizeh. You can't be more perfect, and you can't be a greater gadol. Da hainu, what does this mean? Tayyid yidin. Is there a bottle here? I just need, I'm a graphic guy. It's a bottle, it's a bottle of acid, it's a seltzer. A bottle. A taza. I'm just a visual fellow. Yishikoyach. Yishikoyach, Yishikoyach. A cost can start bringing while you're at it for the same price. Here. <laughs> Where's the more water? Where's the more water? Is there more water in the cup or there's more water in the bottle? The men won't know. What about the ladies? <laughs> Very good. I knew the ladies would know. You see why? Don't worry, don't worry. Gdoilum needs students. Women need husbands to support them. <laughs> don't feel so bad. <laughs> just a joke, just a joke. Everybody understands you don't have to be a uh, rocket scientist or even have a master's in educational psychology 
to know that there is much more water in the bottle than there is the cup. But take a look again and you'll see the cup is full and fulfilled. The body has much more water, but it's not full and it's not fulfilled. What was the challenge? Why could nobody tell this to this boy? And I'll tell you what I think. For many of us, what happens is Yiddishkeit becomes a model, a box. This is called perfection. This is called godless. I can't fit into that box even if I try 70 years. It's not going to happen. My boy called me from yeshiva. So I said, we get this. How is it going? He says, I like it. I say, tell me, the yeshiva has a box, everybody has to fit into the box? He says, absolutely yes. It happens to be that naturally I am shaped according to their box. <laughs> he says, Baruch Hashem, naturally I'm shaped according to their box. The Pshnei Kotlus at the yeshiva of Lakewood, Bismedrish Gavoy of Lakewood, once said that you have Moisdus. He said, it's like, it's a pretty sharp vart. The Gemara said, Chazal say that in Zdoim they had one bed. <laughs> they had one bed. Size, the same size for everybody. What if a person was too short for the bed? They stretched him out till he fit the bed. What if he was too long? They mutilated him. So I once had to speak to somebody who was dealing with this situation. I said, you know, sometimes I feel that a moisid has also a different configuration. Moisid is the same Moisid like Zdoim. <laughs> Sometimes it's the same thing. That's what it is. Same bed for everybody. No individuality. Whoever heard of such a thing? Whoever heard of it? Systems are here for people. People are not here for systems. We're not here to worship systems. We're not here to worship models. We're not here to worship beds. The models and the systems are here to help kids. The kids are not were created to fit systems. Systems were created to help children. So when Yiddishkeit becomes a model, a box, this kid looks, he says, I'll never be a double. I'm going to be the loser. So one guy tells him, you got to be a loser. Gdolim, need losers? Or at least money, then you won't be a loser. Then they'll honor you. Or Gilgulim. What the Rebbe was teaching this boy was something so precious and essential to Yiddishkeit. We don't have models of perfection. We have one model of perfection. Fulfilling the mission that God has put you on the world for. How do you know what that mission is? How do you know what that shlichus is? Al Shem Tev said on the Shama Kom Tairop of the Welt, a soul could come down for 80 years to do one favor to a person. Who knows what a mission is? You want to be a goggle? A goggle means fulfilling the rots in Hashem. That's what your shlichus is. If God created you, then in one week, after learning 10 hours, you could learn an Ahmed Gemara, that's how you'll become the most perfect greatest human being you can become. We don't worship a particular image and we say, this is perfection. I thought they told us that God has no images. <laughs> Suddenly, wherever you look, God has a picture. This is what it looks like. And if you don't fit into this, you're divorced, you're detached. Not Bashamayim, not Ba'or, it's not Bamayim. With my child, I want to polish the diamond that he or she could understand and appreciate. That they have the exact koiches that they need to become the most beautiful, glittering diamonds and divine gifts in this world. Indeed, Avud Ram asks a question. Rosh Hashanah, we say, Hayoyim haras oilam. Haras doesn't really mean birth. You know what haras means? Haras means pregnancy. The term comes from Yirmiya Novi. Yirmiya Novi cursed the day he was born. Yirmiya says, I wish I would have remained forever pregnant. I would have been a stillborn. Haras oilam rachma 
is the expression in Yermia. I wish I would have remained pregnant forever in the womb of my mother. Chazal took the two words of Yermia, Haras, they changed from pregnancy to birth, and Oilam from forever to the world. And Rosh Hashanah, when you look in an English machza, or a Yiddish machza, Yom HaRasam, today is the birthday of the world. That's not what it means. It means today is eternal pregnancy. Yirmiya wanted to die in the womb of his mother. He never wanted to be born because of the curse life that he felt he had. For those of you who studied Yirmiya, again, I don't know if anybody on this side studied Yirmiya, but probably one or two on this side. Jew Jewish men don't learn the Bible. For some reason, I don't know why, the Bible you don't touch. It's for Christians, right? <laughs> it's a funny thing. I speak sometimes Lahavdal to Goyim. And it's an interesting crowd. They're very different than Jews, as you may know. First of all, they listen. <laughs> Second of all, they don't have opinions. When Jews, even Jews who listen, like you, it's with an opinion. He's good, he's not so good, he was better yesterday, not enough jokes, too many jokes. Oh, this I'm going to use, this I'm going to use. Oh, this is a good word, this is a good word. Jews are always having opinions. Goyim, actually, they listen. They also don't sit like this, they don't sit like this. Jews sit like this because it's a defense mechanism. So. It's like a mechitza shobarza. But they actually sit. And, but another interesting thing is you quote a Pesach in Tanakh, they finish it. I'm like, Isaiah 60. Yeah, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> Jews, the best you'll get is shkoyach. <laughs> and that's already a hush of a compliment. It's also not so posh to get shkoyach. But not no more. Yeah, rabbi, amen, hallelujah. But you say a Pesach, they finish. How, asked Avud Ram, how did the Chazal take Haras Oilam, which means forever pregnant, and they turned it into Ayoyim Haras Oilam, today is the birthday of the world. The answer is at the core of your role with our children. And that is, that's the question of Rosh Hashanah. That's the question. Every single person is pregnant with potential. Every person is pregnant with a tremendous child a tremendous blessing that the world is waiting for. The question I have to ask myself on Rosh Hashanah is, what is going to happen? Will my haras oilam remain pregnant? Will my dreams, my potential, my vision, my talents, my resources, my light, will it remain pregnant? And will I suffer a spiritual miscarriage and stillbirth? Or haras oilam will I give birth to my true powers to my true inner light, to my true inner potential. And if you'll notice, on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol used to say a very short fila in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, very short. And he asked for three or four things, and one of them was, Loisapil Isha Pribitna. No woman should have a miscarriage. He didn't ask that sick people should become healthy. He didn't ask that women who can't have children should have children. He didn't ask for long life or health. He asked for one thing, no miscarriage. Why that? Because not only did he mean it literally, he also meant it, meant it symbolically. Every child is the Chan Oitzer Ein Soif. Every child is pregnant with infinite potential. Every child, the Chan Hashanah, which is a Chelek, Elei Kami, Mal, Mamish, it's a piece of the Rebbeinu Shalom in this world. It's pregnant with infinite dignity, value, potential. But how tragic when you see so many people whose little infinite children never make it to the light of day. Haras Oilam has two interpretations. And you and I have to decide what it means for us and what it means for the people under our care. The Nitziv, the Rosh Hashiva of Alojan, Reb Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, once at the completion of one of his forum, told a story and he said, when I was by mitzvah, I heard a conversation between my parents one night. I was supposedly in bed. And Tati told mommy, we tried all these years, no success. Tomorrow I'm taking him to a carpenter. He'll become an apprentice for a carpenter. At that time when you were 13, 
You didn't sit on a bench for the next 15 years so they can make a shidduch for you. If you weren't doing anything, you went to work. You went to work. The Nitziv said, my father said he's going to become an apprentice of a carpenter. At least he'll have a normal job. He'll build standards. I came out crying. And I said, Tata, give me another chance. He said, we tried six years. It's fine. You'll be a wonderful carpenter. I asked him for one more chance. He said, one more day. The next day I applied myself diligently. And here I am today, the Rav and Rosh Hashiva of Alojan. And he told his boys, he said, why? Why did I do it? I'll tell you why. I realized one day I'm going to face my heavenly maker. And you know, the Rebbein Shalom asks everybody, what do you do for a living? <laughs> Let's take a tongue. And I would tell him, I was a carpenter. Shem's new lamazan. And I would show him the shtende. The table, the chair, the bookcase, the menoire, the bim, the darn kodesh. I'm saying, psss. But one question. Where's the Hamik Dover? That's the commentary of the Nitziv on Chumash. Where's the Hamik Sheila? Commentary of Nitziv on Sheiltis. Where's the Imre Shefer? Commentary of the Nitziv on the Haggadah. Where is Eimek HaNetziv? Commentary of the Nitziv on the Sifri. Where are all these Svarim that were supposed to enrich the world of Torah and Yiddishkeit? And I wouldn't have what to answer. So I decided I'm going to learn. So not long ago, a Litvish Rosh Hashiva was talking to his boys who were kvetching banks for many, many years. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He told him the story and then he finished. He said, I'm afraid when you come to heaven... Hashem is going to say, what do you do with your life? They say, what do you mean we sat in Yeshiva and Koilul for years? And Hashem says, really interesting, but I have one question. Who is the shtender? Who is under the sheikh? Who is the banko? Who is the koidish? Hayoim haras oilam. And the Jewish world, the Jewish community, can't thank you enough for the fact that every day, rain and shine, difficult and easy days, children who have one type of challenge or another type of challenge or many challenges. You walk into the room, you look at this little boy or little girl, and what you see is a chilek eleikam imal mamash. Because I know that Ankar could have not had the success it had if it's therapists, if it's educated and enlightened and inspired staff, if it's leadership throughout the entire organization was not permeated with that vision. The Balatanya once said in Kabbalistic words, but I'll explain it. Afayidish, Afayidish kind, Afmen we are state in Machshove, Hagdume, the Odom Kadmoin. Anybody here knows what Machshove, Hagdume, the Odom Kadmoin is? It's a term of the reason. When you look at a Jewish child, you have to see the way he or she stands in the primordial thought of Hashem. What's Pshat? Pshat is Azai. The Gemara says in Chulin, Yaakov saw a ladder. You remember? The malachim were going up and down. Zog the Gemara. The malachim were going up to look at Yaakov's image above. They were coming down to look at Yaakov's image below. What's pshat? Every person has two images. Your image above, your image below. What are these two images? The image below is who I am. What I look like in the mirror. The image above is what Hashem thought about me when he created me. Hashem created every person. What was his machshava when he created you? What did he see? You remember, you ever, one of, any of you ever thought of creating a movement, an organization, a website, a business, a, a kehillah, a school? In your mind's eye, what is this? What do you see? When the Rebbein Shalom created every neshama, what did Hashem see in this neshama, in this body, in this human being? That's the image above. The image below is 
what I look like in reality. And by the way, the Baal Shem Tov said, what's the definition of Gan Eden and Gehenna? <laughs> when you come up, you see the two images. Who you could have been and who you were. For some people it's paradise, for some people it's hell. <laughs> That's what it is. You see who you could have been, who you were meant to be, who you had the potential to be, and then you say, uh, I, I, I didn't realize who I am. I lost it. The malachim went up and down because they never saw a person whose two images were perfectly synchronized. When you walk into that room, whether it's a classroom or a therapy center or the various centers you have or whatever visit type, whatever place it is, and you look at that child, whether he or she is two or three or four or five or 11, any age, your own children, your students, and all of the people under your tender, loving care. What you do every day is you don't only look at their image below, you look at their image above. You don't only look at their image below, one challenge, another challenge, another challenge. This one wrote the child off. This school said, we're not dealing with this person. The parents say, we want to kill ourselves. That's the image below. I can't do anything if that's what I see. I have to see that. You have to see the concrete, but you have to connect the concrete and the abstract. I have to be able to look at this child and ask myself one question. When Hashem created this soul, what did he see? What did he think? What did he see in this person? If I cannot see that in this child, I'm not in the right position. Doesn't mean it's not stressful. It doesn't mean I don't have to practice self-control. It doesn't mean I don't need a good coffee or a shot of caffeine or some of us, whatever we need. I don't want to discriminate against anybody's sensitivities here. <laughs> but what it means is I have to be able to have the vision of seeing the image of this person from God's perspective. In them, in them kind. I want to conclude my words to you today with a story. The story I heard from the Baal HaMaisa he sent it to me by an email, with an email. He's a Jew from England. And it moved me so deeply. And this is what he wrote to me. He said, when I was nine years old, I liked to groom myself. I liked, you know, some kids, you all, are, many of you have kids, you know, some kids like different things. I like to look good, to be neat. I was into my clothes, my hairdo, what I looked like. He came from a, a British, classic, traditional family. And one day, I come into class. It's Parshas Vayesh of learning. And my Rebbe turns to me and he says, I want you to read this Rashi loud. And I thought, well, great, today's my turn. I didn't realize what's coming. Which Rashi did he give me to read? You could remember. Ela told us, Yaakov, who nar? Dr. Ashi, Oisa, Maisa, Nai. You also read that Rashi? I see you all know that Rashi. Wow. Huh? <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Not the Bible. Genesis, they learn. Genesis, not the Bible. But they'll learn. They're going to learn the Bible this year. They'll have it on the night table of Tamach. They'll learn. Zokrashi Oisa Maisenayrus. Oisa was doing, he was behaving like a kid. And one of the examples is Mesalsal Basara. He combed his hair. And I'm reading the Rashi, he says, I'm nine years old. I'm innocent. I'm just reading the Rashi innocently. And the teacher says, Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. He says, Do you know who Rashi is talking about? 
I said, yeah, Yosef. He says, that's you. He's talking about you. And the boys start laughing. Everybody knows he grooms himself. They're hard, shineless. He says, I run out of the classroom. And I run home. I run home. Weeping, humiliated in public, weeping. My father was home. I walk into my father's office. He was sitting by his desk. I'm crying. He says, what happened? I tell him. Muhammad only had a relationship with his father that he could tell him, right? Some of you know very well when you would come home from yeshiva crying because the Rebbe gave you a flask, you got Arbo Vachamisha, right? Arbo Vachamisha, on a good day. But you'll soon understand he had a father. He had a real father. So he comes home to his father and he tells his father what happened. And he tells me, he says, Rabbi Jacobson, my father looked, he thought. He said, I love it. I love the comparison. I love it. I always see you as Yosef. Do you know the end of the story with Yosef? You know the end of the story? He dreams that everyone is going to come bowing down to him. The brothers are so jealous. But he saves the world from hunger. He saves his family from hunger. The reason you and I and Kalal Yisrael are here today is because Yosef, I always saw you as that boy. I always, what a good comparison. You're destined to leadership, to greatness. I love it. He said, my father gave me a hug. And that was it. The wound disappeared. And he tells me, I have to tell you, not a week goes by when one of my classmates doesn't call me <laughs> and say, I need advice. I need a loan. I need assistance. I need help here. I need help there. I made it very, very successful person, an affluent person. Not a week goes by, one of those kids doesn't call me and say, wow, how did you become such an Ishmael? Sliach, could you help us? A couple of dollars, a little eights, a little this. He says, my father was right. And then I realized the preciousness of your work. Every gesture you make to your child, even your body language, the way you greet those boys and girls when you meet them in the morning or in the afternoon or the evening, your attitude, your perspective, even the things that you say before they leave or right when you begin, besides for the work itself, the way you look at them, the way you value them, the way you believe in them, the way you ex accentuate their potential. Never, never underestimate its timeless and eternal impact and benefits because in Judaism the way we celebrate the birthday of the world the birthday of the planet the birthday of civilization the birthday of the cosmos is only one way by celebrating the life and the potential of one Jewish child thank you for your work a good event